This is Ron Real Entrepreneurship, the show that brings the no-nonsense truth of what is required to start, grow, and scale your business. I am your host, Susan Sly. Well, hey, what is up, Ron Real Entrepreneurs? Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're having an amazing day. And uh, my guest and I were just laughing at me, actually. No, she wasn't laughing. She was laughing with me. Um, and the day we're doing the show, it is Friday night on the East Coast. It's Friday afternoon for me. And uh, we were talking about aging parents. We were talking about proper pronunciation. And I was like, we just need to do the 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 show and get the party started. So um, I know many of you listening know that I love wine and I know you love wine too, because we talk about it on the show quite often. And um, I think at some point, uh, I one of my guests and I were talking about, let's just drink wine and, and do the show all the time. So that could make, happen. Uh, it's not happening right now if you're listening, but um, it could happen at a future date. But my guest today is the co-founder and CEO of Unfem wines. And if you are right now, France is not in the top 10. Sorry, you got knocked out of the top 10. So none of you are in France, but Canada, I think is number three right now. So if you are in Canada and you like me grew up in Canada, grew up speaking French, you know, it's une femme, just so we can pronounce it correctly. And une femme wine specializes in women made champagne and sparkling wine. Like how delicious they give back to charities that benefit women. Previously, this founder was the CEO and founder of the beloved The Riddler Champagne Bars in New York City and San Francisco, and I'm sure has stories about that, and the founder of Magnum PR, the leading San Francisco-based restaurant PR agency. She comes from a tremendous background in food and beverage. She's been featured as Forbes Top 30 Under 30. I was reading her bio, and I'm going... Good Lord, Stanford, London School of Economics, and yet she's humble. She's beautiful. If you can't see her right now, she's absolutely glowing. And we have to talk about, you know, what's going on there. Um, maybe it's the wine. I don't know. But my guest today is the one and only Jen Pelka. So Jen, thank you for being on the show. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's such a joy to be here. And I'm happy that it's uh, post five o'clock, uh, somewhere I am in fact, drinking a glass of my wine. So cheers to that. You know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to hot yoga, even though it's 120 degrees here in Scottsdale today. Oh you could do it outside. Yeah, I, I could, I could, it's not humid enough. And I'm, I, I think I must be a sucker for punishment, but I will be having wine after the yoga. Oh, so yeah. I will be sure you hydrate. Before the wine. <laughs> yeah, don't drink wine and do hot yoga. That's gonna yeah. be messy. I've never done yeah. that, nor would I. I I wanna I wanna jump in and ask you, like you, you know, you people can't see it, but you literally have this glow about you. And we have this, you know, raw and real entrepreneurship. Obviously, we're gonna talk about being an entrepreneur. I know earlier today you mentioned you were you have a funny story about fundraising. So is the glow from fundraising or is it <laughs> Not. We, did, we did have a good fundraising day today. Um, I have done a lot of fundraising for this company as well as for previous companies. And we did a very small bridge round today um, mm -hmm. and it went extremely well. Um, so we set out to do a series A extension. Um, so we had previously done a $10 million series A, which was oversubscribed to 14 million. Um, and then we just did a small extension because right now the economy is so challenging and we just want to really make sure that our balance sheet is in the best possible position that it possibly can be as we're working towards profitability. So we today reached out to our current investors to raise a million and it was oversubscribed in about four hours. And so I'm up to 1.175 in uh, a very short period of time, and we'll get to one five by later today, and then we're closing it. But it was a very, very quick round. And it was fun to see so much support from our existing investor base coming back to get back involved. And it was a really nice feeling because, you know, being an entrepreneur is not easy every day. But it's amazing when you have a really great group of supporters that come back to continuously support you. And we're 
so, so grateful. So perhaps that is contributing to the glow. <laughs> you're, you're incredible, Jen. I mean, seriously, I love the transparency about doing the extension because one of the founders I interviewed on the show recently was talking about the season of no, and he's in Silicon Valley. He's already had a successful exit. He's on his second company, which usually be like funded like that. And he's like, it's the season of no. And I was reading Crunchbase this morning and a lot of startups are doing debt-based if they can get it. Um, we just did an extension at Radius and, you know, we are, we had amazing investors that, you know, put in money and then one investor put in like 1.2. Um, but it's, it's a crazy season to raise money. Let, let me ask you when you did your A round, what year was that? It was last year in April. So 2022 in April, it was a very, very good time to raise money. And it was right before it became a very bad time to raise money. And we had previously done two friends and family rounds. Mm -hmm. um, and then we went out to do an institutional raise. Um, we had a lot of interest and we were super happy with our lead who we ended up moving forward with. Um, they're an amazing private equity firm. And um, we also got previous investors to invest back in again. And mm. um, then we have paused on any kind of fundraising um, because the economy has been so challenging and it has totally been a season of no. I have a lot of friends who are founders who found it especially hard in the past year. But the way that we ended up doing our raise today, which we have done previously and which really worked for us, is, well, first and foremost, we are um, very communicative with our investors. So we, on a very religious basis, send a monthly investor update um, to all of our investors. So small private individuals, SPVs, our VC, our, our private equity fund, that's our lead, and then two private individuals who are also leads who are also in the boardroom with us. And every single month we send, as I said, these very detailed um, investor updates which I had not done with my previous companies. And I cannot recommend it more because um, we get so much incredibly positive feedback from our investors saying, thank you so much for keeping me in the loop. And it's amazing to be along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people who invest, especially as friends and family investors or small angel checks, do it to be part of something. And they're doing it to support the founders. Um, and of course, they hope that they maybe pick one that is going to go to the moon. But I think that I have written myself many angel checks, and I'm shocked by how few actually send any updates, like even an I annual know. update. And I think it's the best tool for um, longevity of a company. And it provides so much rigor for us internally. Um, as a team, everybody on the team contributes to the investor updates. We have 12 people on our team. So um, we ask every single person to put in updates into them on a monthly basis. And then our investors know what's going on. They're able to help. We can ask for things. We can ask for support. And we had a huge, huge announcement today. And I coupled that with fundraise. So they went hand in hand. So we announced today that we got approved by... Um, a concessionaire called Levy. There are three national concessionaires. There's Levy, Aramark, and Delaware North. Levy oversees 364 stadiums around the U.S., mm -hmm. um, including Chase Center, Wrigley Field, Churchill Downs, SoFi Stadium, Crypto Arena. Like, name your favorite arena, it's on the list. And we got approved as one of the wines um, at the stadiums. So we were able to say, hey, everybody, with this massive news, and we're opening up another million dollars of allocation. This is, we believe, the last chance any of you investors will have as private individuals to invest and to increase your equity sh stake in the company. And like, let us know if you're interested. And we preceded that with some soft outreach to people we knew who would be interested. So we were like, we already have 400K committed who else is interested? And then we sent a follow-up three hours later saying, ah, we have 800 committed now. Who's interested now? By the time I got on this call, which was six hours into it, we had 1.2 basically committed. So we'll be able to wrap it up and then 
this will be like a part of our story with our investors of like how cool it is that it happened so quickly in this season when it is so hard. So I would encourage like any entrepreneurs who are out there thinking about fundraising or thinking that they ever might. My biggest advice is send out a monthly investor update. In the beginning, it feels like a pain, but it becomes something that you can look back on and see all of your forward movement. And then when you do a fundraise, couple it with early guaranteed interest so that people already know that people are in and then create like some kind of FOMO around it because then people will come in. Mm -hmm. And we're so, so, so grateful to our investors. So it was a good day today. I got chills for you because the as you were sharing and and what if if people aren't seeing Jen's face like when she's talking about our investors, she is lighting up and and I know a very similar story for us. It's we do Zoom meetings and it's we invite them and it's like a family reunion and we and one of our investors he was a former SVP at um, Morgan Stanley. He's like, I've written a ton of angel checks. You guys do Zoom meetings. Like, I see your face, Susan, as a CEO, when you're reporting out, when you're talking about what's going on, you actually let us ask questions. Like, he's like, and, and the same thing, Jen, I have um, several companies I'm invested in now and one I'm advising, but I will, the some of them all literally text the founder and be like, hello, what's going on? You know, send it out. And And I think sometimes for founders, the reason they don't is because they don't feel they have anything to say. So let me ask you, have you ever sent out an update and you're like, there's nothing really new to report? What did you do? <laughs> there are some months that feel lighter than others, but we we always have a lot of forward movement. And I'm sure that those founders have a ton of things they're working on. They just don't realize how interesting they really are. Mm. Um, I think that also a lot of founders don't send them one because they don't think they have enough time. And two, sometimes they start feeling guilty that they haven't sent one recently enough. So then they're just like, Oh, maybe I'll do it next month. Maybe I'll do it quarterly. Maybe I'll do it every six months. Maybe I'll do it once a year. And it starts to feel like a monkey on your back. And I know with my previous companies, I did not let investors into as much information. And I really wish I had, and that was a huge learning for me. My mm. previous um, my previous companies, the Riddler, the champagne bars, I had to close because of COVID. And um, I had 33 investors, all of whom were women in San Francisco, 40 investors, all of whom were women in New York. And um, I'm so, so grateful to those communities. Many of those women have actually invested in, in Femme, even though they lost all of their money in the Riddler. And, mm -hmm. but we did have as you can imagine, several investors who were really upset that they weren't kept in the loop earlier. And it was just a really big learning for me that if we were more transparent, um, we maybe could have asked for help earlier, or we maybe could have just made people feel like they knew what was going on earlier. And yeah, it's just one of my biggest learnings from those restaurants. Yeah, I appreciate the vulnerability. I grew up in the restaurant business. It's hard. That was our family so business. And so my dad made me promise um, before we went into the, the show, we were talking about our parents. I was talking to about my dad. My dad listens to the show every week. So he likes when I mention him. Hi, um, hi dad. <laughs> <laughs> His name's Joe. <laughs> so uh, he made me promise not to go into the restaurant business. He said, be an entrepreneur, but just don't go into that business. The and, and I love your transparency. It's like, yeah, we lost those businesses. How did you, when those businesses had to close, like, did you, like, how did you handle that? Like emotionally, physically, like. Uh, I mean, it definitely took two full years for me to kind of get over it. And I would say it still percolates a bit in the back of my mind. Um but it's incredibly emotional. It's you. I, I think you go through grief in the same way as losing someone really important to you. And you go through many stages. There are, you know, the seven stages. There's the anger. There's the denial. There's the bargaining. There's, you know, all of those components. Um, because you put so much of your heart into your work. If you're an entrepreneur, you're not doing it because it's easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it. And you're 
you're hopefully doing it from a place of passion. And I certainly was. Um, and we also had so many incredible people in our community. We had, of course, our team and all of those people lost their jobs. They worked really hard, especially through COVID, putting themselves on the line. And we had an amazing community of regular guests at the Riddler. And still to this day, people who reach out over Instagram or if I run into them who just say, oh my gosh, I miss the Riddler so much. Like restaurants become for people places where they make memories and get engaged and get married and have just really wonderful moments. And um, restaurants are such an important fabric of our lives. And so I'm really touched whenever I hear somebody say how much they miss it. Mm -hmm. And now we hope that that spirit lives on with Unfem and that people can kind of bring that to their own homes and to their own you know, friend groups and families, but you can't really replace a restaurant. Like they're, they're so special. They're really important to us. Yeah. They, it's they, it, it, when I think about all the traveling I do and all the places I go and go back to like New York or Boston or like these major Atlanta and all of my big memories are tied to nights out with colleagues, like at, at a restaurant. To that of course. Point. And uh, even I'm going to Toronto in um, for an AI and, and data conference in October. And I'm like already thinking of my favorite restaurant there. And to your point, it, I, you know, I'm so curious about this because oftentimes the statistics show that when a founder has had a business that um, I don't like the word failure, but it just, you know, it, it didn't go that they're so successful the second time because they learned, but but yet only a small percentage of them will have the guts to do it again. So where did that courage come from for you? Um, I'm not really sure where the courage came from aside from my parents, um, which is absolutely true. I think that that's definitely where it comes from. And in this case, my brother, my only sibling is my co-founder and business partner. And thank God we have each other because on days when he wants to quit, I don't let him. And on days when I want to quit, he doesn't let me. So, you know, they don't come along too often, but you know, there are some hard days for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think having gone through the closure of another business, um, I, first of all, I fully appreciate how important it is to push forward and how serious my responsibility as a founder, especially as like the steward of other people's capital is. Mm -hmm. um, and also like, I don't like to not win. So my plan is for this company to do really, really, really well. It already does well. And I'd love for us to have a really, really, really remarkable story um, in the long term. And have impact to, to a lot of people. Um, but I think that the, the courage and the resilience really comes from, um, from just grit. And so much of that is a muscle that is built through perseverance and, um, trying and failing and getting back up and, and moving forward. And, there's this incredible video of this artist, which I don't know if you've ever seen it. I wish I knew his name. Um, I'll send it to you so you can include it in the show notes. But yeah. um, it's a he starts at the bottom of a staircase and keeps falling off and there's a trampoline below. And then he goes and the trampoline bounces him to the step right above and then the step right above and the step right he keeps falling off. And then he goes to the step below and the step. And then eventually he makes it to the top and it gives you the goosebumps every time. And I think that that's um, what entrepreneurialism is all about, that you're, you know, you're climbing towards something, but you will fall off course many times. But each time those falls feel a little bit less awful. And um, each time you bounce back a little bit faster. When you write your New York Times bestseller, uh, I just thought yeah. of it a little less awful could be the title. <laughs> like what the heck I am. There you I, go. I yeah. was saying to my husband, like I have the worst book buying habit. Like I am oh, old school. Me too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How, oh, yeah. how bad is yours? Let's have a confessional I mean, in front of thousands how, of people all over. The how many per week? Is that what we're saying? Like, like five ish per week. 
audio or actual books? I never or- do audio. Uh, no, just actual books. There's, I have a rule, which is there are very few things I will buy no matter what. And it's if I um, see or hear of a book that looks in any way interesting, I will buy it. Like if it takes my, and I buy it immediately. So do I. Because I will never regret having, you know, a massive collection of books. And I mean, this is maybe this is part of where my resilience comes from. Resiliency comes from my husband and I um, lost our home to a wildfire mm. in 2020 in the midst of COVID. And so we lost all of our books and all of our cookbooks and also everything else we owned. Um, and which that really puts things into perspective. And so now um, I just have a rule that if I want a book, I buy it. <laughs> so, so, okay. My sister from another mister. So the, I, I keep saying to myself, I'm like, okay, this is going to be the trip that I go through the airport and I don't buy a book. And you know, SFO, they have Barbara's books like that. Don't even get me started. I, like I, if I have a three hour labor, I'm like, yes, I'm in Barbara's books. Like, so I carry this, um, I have a big like purse I carry when I'm traveling, I've got a blanket and, and I'm like, oh, there are no room for books. I came back from this trip. I bought, there was a gal from NVIDIA who had written two books. Of course I bought her books. I bought two in the airports. I came back with four yeah, it's it. Yeah, I yeah, totally. How many feel that. how many books would you say you read in a year? Oh, well, in a month, I read somewhere from three to five. Yeah, I so do, a book a week. Yeah, yeah, I audio read too, just because I am I'm a runner, and mm-hmm. so and sometimes I will depending on the book, like I'll even read a book twice. Um, if it's really good. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll buy the audio version if I like want to read it again, but run. So. Yeah. I mm. love that. I listen to tons and tons of podcasts when I'm working out and when I'm cooking and driving and walking and things like that, but I should probably switch over to audiobooks because they're, you know, they're so fun. Then you're going to be buying 10 a week. I know. <laughs> no it's kidding. so easy. No like, kidding. Like double <laughs> click or facial. I like, yeah. Whoo! just bought a library. Um, I, I know we're digressing. It's the, the producer of the show. She's going to be like, Jen needs to come back. You need to keep, now you guys need a book club, the entrepreneurial book club. Oh yeah. Hey, I would totally do that. We actually, we partnered (laughs) with a book club called Zibby's books and it's Zibby's books is founded by this amazing woman, Zibby. She has an incredible store in Santa Monica. Um, and she has an amazing publishing house and book club. And, um, we just did our first book club collaboration with her called wine people. And, um, we send out from our website, you can purchase them a box of, um, our sparkling wines and one of her books. So we'll have to send you one. A wine themed book club. I'm already yes. thinking like under the Tuscan sun. I'm thinking oh, yeah. okay. If back to entrepreneurship. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Where did the idea for Unfem come from? So I'm I'm envisioning like the you know the restaurants had closed. You're you know going through all the Elizabeth Kubler Ross stages of grief, and then it's like, but you have such an extensive background, like recurring diner on top, you know, on all of these shows, right? And the Food Network and like all of these cool things. So this is in your blood. Clearly, you're going to do something in this sector. But how did it happen? And the idea. So we actually launched the brand at the Riddler when the Riddler was open um, at the end of 2019. And um, it started because, as I mentioned, all of our investors were women. And um, at the Riddler, the only wine that you could get was champagne or sparkling wine. We had no still wine and um, we only had one beer, Miller High Life, the champagne of beers. Uh, and as you can imagine- That um, is the tagline, but I would disagree as a you know, wine enthusiast, <laughs> yes. Yes, totally. But our, you know, our wine list was hundreds of bottles of champagne and it could be a bit intimidating. And so we started featuring a page that was women made wines and those wines would outsell everything else. And I was like, why is there not a brand that's all about women made and gives back to charities that benefit women? And so we have this amazing woman, Julie Medvi of the Gunny Medvi family in, um, in Champagne, who was a regular when she would come to the United States. She loved the Riddler. And so through our friends who were wine distributors and importers, 
they were like, why don't you do a project with Julie and she can do your house wine? So that was our first wine that we launched. That was an organic grower producer, um, Chardonnay forward champagne. Um, she's a fifth generation wine producer and mm. just such an incredible force of a woman. So that was our first wine. And it really was meant to be our wine at the restaurants, like our, like our truly our house wine. And, um, from there, we realized that our top selling wine was always whatever was a sparkling rosé by the glass that was an mm-hmm. affordable sparkling rosé. No matter what we put on, that would outsell everything else. And so I reached out to one of my favorite women winemakers in California, Samantha Sheehan, and asked her if we could collaborate on a sparkling rosé from California. So our first version of what's now called the Cali, which is our California sparkling rosé, um, was made by this amazing woman, Sam. And, um, that is one of the wines for us that really took off. And so after we closed the Riddler, we still had this wine brand. And I said to my brother who had been sort of like our CFO at the, at the restaurants, I was like, what if this, we make this a real company. And so the first year was really hard. It was just, he and I, we were frankly working on all of the closing documentation and the wind down process. Um, at the Riddler, we were fighting with one of our landlords. Um, it was a really arduous process. And so he and I decided that we wanted to launch Unfem as a company that would just be he and I. We wouldn't accept any outside money outside from the um, small amount of investor checks we had received very, very early on from two private individuals. Um, and that we would run it almost like a lifestyle business. Like we would pay ourselves and we would run it in a really profitable way. And like, we would grow low and slow. Mm. Then, uh, we were faced with an opportunity that we did not expect that really came to us through a combination of luck and right place, right time, which was, um, my husband is a restaurateur. He has six Greek restaurants in San Francisco called Suvla. Anybody who's listening, who lives in San Francisco, um, we'll probably say, oh my God, I'm a regular at Suvla. Everybody goes to Suvla in San Francisco. So the Delta Airlines team had been looking to partner with a restaurant um, after COVID to bring some surprise and delight to their customers. And so um, they reached out to the Suvla team and Suvla ended up doing all of the first class food from San Francisco on the long haul destinations. And in that process, I was involved in a little bit of the whining and dining and entertaining of the Delta team when they were coming to San Francisco. And my husband said, do you want to just present your wines to them? And I was like, oh my God, I should totally, yes, show them the (laughs) wines." So um, we introduced them to the wines in one of the meetings very casually. And they had an opportunity that October um, for the Breast Cancer Research Fund Um, because every year they do a big partnership with the BCRF in October for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And they were like, can you do these minis, um, our little sparkling bottles on board all the planes? And I was like, sure. So they asked us to do 5,000 cases in one month. And up until that point, we had only done 1,600 cases in two years. And so we had to scramble to figure it out. And we did. And um, so we figured that out. And then we worked over the next um, like six months or so to develop a sparkling wine in can and Delta has a huge focus on sustainability. And so that was cans were really important to them. And they also have a huge commitment to diversity and inclusion and working with um, founders of companies that are, you know, unusual. And um, certainly as a woman, it is unusual to be in a position to get to, to work with, you know, a company like Delta. And so we have grown our relationship with Delta over the past two and a half years. And we are now the sparkling wine on board every Delta plane in the world, which is wild. And we're so grateful for that partnership. We love working with them. And this October, we're doing um, another um, another special sparkling rosé for them um, just for BCRF month. So we love working with them. And that has opened up so many doors for us. Um, we know that, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of customers see us on Delta each year. 
And um, we have a QR code on our cans. So a lot of people go to our website through the QR code. And then that's opened up a lot of opportunities for us in the travel sector. So we have a big partnership with Marriott. Um, We're in the Marriott luxury collection. So our wines are available by the glass um, at every Ritz-Carlton in the U.S., um, as well as um, St. Regis, JW, and Autograph Collection Hotels. And then um, we have a big partnership with Kimpton. Um and on and on and on. So we're now launching, I'm super excited. We're launching at every Neiman Marcus, which is so cool. So they're amazing. We're now um, at about 350 targets across the country. So anybody who has a target close to them, we're likely on shelves. Um, And we're starting to get um, a lot of additional retail distribution across the US. So we have just launched with a handful of stores in Total Wine in California and beyond and beyond. So that's it. It's incredible. And when you think about the, like you go from Neiman Marcus and the Ritz to Target. Yeah. <laughs> right? like it's, well, that it's pronounced Target. No. We, we, <laughs> yes, no, no, and I, it's true. So true. When Target came to Canada being Canadian, we all were like, oh, Target. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I love Target. I've been a Target shopper since I was, you know, a kid. And, um, I think that Target does such an incredible job with their merchandising around, you know, all of the household necessities of the highest quality and great value. Um, But then also they do such cool collaborations with fashion designers, with home interior designers. I'm a huge um, Joanna Gaines fan. I I was just about to say Magnolia, the Magnolia portion of the store, like, and the candles. I was just in there the other day. You can't possibly walk away without buying something. I mean, I think, you know, it's like the funny thing about a Target run is you go in for like toothpaste and you walk out $150 later with like hopefully some Unfem in your cart and definitely some Magnolia candles and, um, you know, a cute bathing suit and books. You know, definitely <laughs> some books. books, of course, like so many books. <laughs> and then I love what they've done in the beauty aisle. They, I have so many friends who are beauty entrepreneurs who have been so supported by Target and who have gotten such incredible um, brand extensions at Target. And um, it's so cool because it's a real discovery store. And Mm. um, for anybody who hasn't shopped the wine aisle at Target, um, they have really, really great wines. And they have a huge focus also on diversity and inclusion with really great brands. A lot of brands that we're friends with, like Yes Way Rosé is women-owned, two amazing women, McBride Sisters, two amazing Black women who are sisters, um, the team from Bev, also a female founder. So we've got a lot of friends on the shelves there. That's, that's amazing. And I, you know, I, I was writing down the Cali, so I'm going to order some of that. The, um, the plus as a get again, because it's so darn hot here, like I, Rosé is my, especially, or like if I'm in France, like a Sancerre. Yeah, I know it's a still wine, but such a gorgeous wine when it's 120 degrees. Um, so yes, in Arizona, you can drink sparkling rosé all year round. Because, all year round. Um, yes. Well, <laughs> in France, do you know what's, what's hot on hot days is a piscine is what they call it, which is um, a wine glass filled to the top with ice and then you pour your wine on top. So mm-hmm. even the French drink their wine on ice sometimes. There you go. Yes, it's not gauche. Let's put it that way. That's right. <laughs> the, one of the things you said, I, um, did you read Para Golden's book? when she was talking about building Hint? Um, you know, I haven't read that book, but I should. So there's a point in the book. I can't believe I've read one you haven't read. So now we have our, our Jen and Susan book club, just so you know, and, and yet please text me any that you think I should read. Yes. Yeah. So I was, I, w- I confess I bought Kara's book probably in an airport and um, Kara, it's interesting with Hint because for that company, it's very similar that, you know, she was, she was like trying to get into Whole Foods. She was trying to, you know, and then she finally gets into Whole Foods and then it sells out and they're like, you need to bring it back. And she's literally trying to do this out of her garage in San Francisco and trying to figure it out. Her husband's digging in, they both came out of tech and she's like, right. And in that moment, what do you, I mean, obviously there's a networking piece, some people would call it luck, but you were prepared because even though you hadn't been um, doing that kind of volume, I want to understand Jen, because I'm such a curious person when they asked for that 5,000 case order, like break it down. What did you do? 
other well, than yes, that's awesome. And now where do we get it? Like, how did that, how did you do it? Yeah. Luckily my brother, as I said, who's my co-founder is a real ops expert. Okay. He's there behind the scenes. He's our COO. He runs everything on ops, finance, budgeting, logistics, compliance. Um, whereas I'm much more focused on, you know, getting the sale. So I got the sale. Mm-hmm. So he largely was the one who figured it out. Um, but we just called in so many favors. We called everybody we knew in Napa Valley who might know anything about where to get 5,000 cases of these miniature bottles. We talked to all of our friends who were vineyard sources who might have access to the grapes and the, and like still wine that we needed. Um, and we, um, we, you know, honestly, some of the hardest parts of that is really around packaging, which is for a bottle of wine is not just like the exterior box. It's the glass. It's the label. Um, in the case of a champagne bottle, it's a cork. It's a um, it's a foil. It's the little piece of wire around it. It's the um, little cap on top. So it's all of those components. And, um, you know, in all of those cases, we truly, you know, we stepped back, put together a list of all of the component parts that we needed, um, everybody we possibly knew and put a plan together and just called everybody we possibly could. The crazier story was when um, we were working to do our cans on Delta and we had gotten approved, but not officially approved. But in order to hit their deadline, we had to bring all of these printed cans into the United States. And this was during the time that Um, that all of the boats were stuck in the, like in the Panama Canal. So we ended up chartering a plane from Dubai and putting the cans on the plane and bringing them across. And we hadn't closed our series A yet. So my brother put millions of dollars worth of cans on his credit card. And we don't even really know how he got approved for that amount of money on his credit card, but somehow it went through and thank God Delta actually picked up the order and thank God our series A came through because we would have been in a real pickle, but I wouldn't advise it, but it worked out in the end. Yeah, that's a sleepless night or three, right? It's oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. also, think, what would we have done with these cans if... That's a, a big like party. The you order go to, go to Burning through. Man and sell them. That's all I That was my first thought. I don't know. The only yeah. reason I thought that is um, Brent Martin, who I had on the show, um, we're supposed to meet up in New York, and he's like, sorry, I've been at Burning Man. I've been like, oh, so God, know, that's, just, that. <laughs> that's just why I thought of that. That would, that would yeah. be what I, I would probably recommend. But I think you like, can't even sell them there because everything has to be bartered. So I guess we could barter them for like a bus and then we could drive the bus home and then we could sell the bus. Like that's how I would think about it. But that probably wouldn't be enough money. No, so. no. <laughs> <laughs> Your brother is, he must be calm under pressure. Mm. I he is extremely organized and he is like a dog with a bone. Like he won't stop until the project is finished. Mm. And so he is, he likes pressure in moments like that. And um, yeah, he gets really level-headed and just really, really focuses until something is completely finished. Um, and he may but- show you something different because you know, you've known each other your entire life, oh, yeah. but outwardly he sounds to me like he's a guy like, okay, we'll figure it out. But behind closed doors, you know, oh, yeah, like- absolutely. Of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we always do. That's the thing is like, we always figure it out. So, so what's yeah. that? I mean, thinking about this journey you've gone through and I'm so in awe of how far you've come from, you know, essentially creating your house one in 2019 shutting down the rulers, going through that, going through the grieving process to now Delta, Ritz Carlton, Target, like the whole list. And when you think of it, Jen, that's a very short period of time. Like it's crazy. We do, we do hear this from people, especially people in the wine world. Like our distributor tells us all the time, like, wow, this is pretty unusual. Um, but I don't know, we just swing for the fences. Like my, the next things that I want to do. And if anybody's listening and has connections, I will, you know, uh, 
take you to your whatever, you know, Eras tour or Beyonce show or whatever you want. But the the three places I want to be, I want to be at Yankee Stadium, I want to be at the White House, and I want to get this wine on the moon. So I can help I, you with the first one easily. Oh, great. Great, great, great. Yeah. Um, well, the, tell me, the, uh, you know, are you a Taylor Swift person or a Beyonce person or uh, be, uh, anything else? <laughs> Beyonce. Okay, um, let's go. I love Taylor. Hey, I'm, I'm so yeah. impressed with Taylor. I think it's just because I'm 50 and I'm kind of like, you know, yeah. destiny's child. And oh, yeah. you know, I don't think you're ready for this jelly. Yeah. Um, totally. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was watching, uh, I was watching the second sex in the city movie for the like 50 millionth time the other day on the Peloton. And, uh, I just need every time I'm getting ready to go to New York, I need my fashion inspiration. So that's my go-to. That's it. like now everyone in all the countries that listen know this. So anyhow, I, um, I, you know, and Liza Minnelli is in that one and she's doing the cover of single ladies. Right. So yeah, I'm like any Beyonce song and I'm all, I, I keep listening every single day to break my soul oh, every single day. Amazing. Yeah. So I mean, she is a force. Uh -huh. This year has been so amazing seeing, you know, Beyonce, T-Swift, Greta, like the effect of women on the economy. And then you look at everything that's happening this year, the celebration of 50 years of um, of equal prize money at the U.S. Open, everything that's happening in U.S. women's soccer, everything that's happening with the LPGA. I mean, I think the world is finally waking up to the buying power of women mm -hmm. and for us, we know 80% of wine purchases are made by women. Um, and there is just so much power. Unless in you're a woman sending your husband to go get your wine. That's right. Which is what I do. do. <laughs> but you're probably telling him which ones you want and oh, yeah. dictating, you know, the purchase that's actually being made. Oh, hundred percent. We're seeing it in AI. So the, uh, I, I was telling Jen, I just got back from the voice and AI conference in DC and I was speaking there and I'm just like on the, like next week I'm speaking at fashion week and it's the, um, the future of women in AI. Then I, um, am going to Austin. I don't even know where I'm going to Austin the following week. And there's this women in AI are having a moment and I got off stage and I have, um, once we at, at some point when we exit, um, the, the AI company that I co-founded with five guys. So it's like having five brothers. It's like it, bananas and beautiful and crazy. So I have my idea for my next company, which will be women funded, women founded. So I come off the stage Jen, and I come out and, you know, all these women were talking and, you know, one woman's like undergrad from Harvard and she has her MBA from MIT. She's like, Sloney, Sloney. I'm like, Slo anyway, so I'm telling her about this idea. She's like, I want to fund it. I'm like, dude, it's a PowerPoint right now, but thank you. You know, I, but it's, you know, like we're having our moment, female founded, female funded, and it's about damn time, right? Like when that you think is, about it. Mm -hmm. It is so true. Well, please yeah. keep me informed when you're raising, because I am super interested to know. I could talk to you offline now. I'm going to, in front of all the viewers, listeners, longtime listeners, so the connection I'm going to give Jen, I'm a big believer in network and the, the, I don't believe in luck. I believe in your network. And so your network grows because you're a good person and you like, I just do things for people. I don't ask, ask for anything in return. But when you say Yankee stadium, if you're a long time listener of the show, like I've done, I don't know, 350 shows, the um, you'll know who I'm going to introduce her to. Who's one of my closest friends. And so that's going to happen as soon as we're off this show. So I've got one final question for you. Like, what did your day look like? I mean, seriously. Oh my God. Like, it's so different every single day. Because you're not just I, the CEO, you're the CSO, you're the chief CXO, you're like the CMO, like you're, because there, you have a small lean team, which I so am in awe of, but what does your day look like? So I travel a ton, just like you do. So excluding travel days, um, when I am home, um, my husband and I recently moved to Sonoma, which we love so much. And we switched from living in a 800 square foot apartment in San Francisco to an acre in Sonoma. Um, so I love to start my morning pretty early. I, I love like a six o'clock ish. I don't use a, um, 
an alarm clock, but I naturally kind of wake up early. I love to get up, make the coffee and go read outside. We have a little pond in our, in our, I guess you would call it a backyard. Um, and so I love to sit by the pond and watch all the birds. We have so many amazing birds in the morning. Um, we have quail, we have owls, we have um, hawks, we have hummingbirds, we have so many amazing birds. So I love to sit out there and on a great day, I'll get to read for a full hour. If not, I try to get at least 15 minutes. Um, and I read everything from novels to nonfiction. I try to, to read novels in the morning though, um, just to like clear my mind. And then um, if I have enough time, I'll go for a walk. We have beautiful vineyards across the street from our house. So I'll do about a 45 minute walk through um, those vineyards. And I always listen to a podcast. I tend to listen in the morning to either um, Armchair Expert with Dex Shepard, or um, I love Smartless. Um, I also love how I built this. I love uh, Rich Roll, like, you know, any of those kinds of podcasts. And then I come back, um, take a shower and get ready. And um, then I'm on my computer like all day long. So I tend to get a little drowned in my inbox. Um, so I like to clear out my inbox as best as I can in the morning. Um, and then I'm on Zoom calls like all day long, back to back to back. Um, I've increasingly tried to work my day and my week so that I'm doing as many sales meetings as I possibly can and with as many large opportunities as possible. So like I'm really trying to focus on Fortune 500 companies, household name brands, best in category brands that we can build partnerships with. Um, I also, of course, spend a lot of time with our team. So I spend a lot of time, especially with our executive team, which is our chief sales officer, our CMO, and my brother, our COO. Um, but I also spend a lot of time in like individual or team related meetings. Um, I also take calls regularly with other entrepreneurs. I very much agree with you that like your network is your net worth. And I've found some of my greatest sales leads through direct competitors who have introduced me to places where they have great relationships and I do the same. And, um, so yeah, I do that. I, um, generally end my day at five or six o'clock. Um, I like to spend about an hour in the garden. We have insane gardens in Sonoma. So we just have this crazy tomato harvest and we, um, had 19 different varietals of tomatoes. <laughs> we were a little overextended on the tomatoes, um, but I spend time in the garden um, and then I cook for dinner um, and I love to cook uh, with my husband. And for my husband, we have a, um, a wood burning fireplace in our kitchen. So nice. we'll do like a steak in the fireplace or a whole fish and some like a beautiful fresh veggie situation. Um, like a beautiful salad. Um, we open, of course, a nice bottle of wine. Um, and then we talk for an hour or two or three hours. And um, most of the time we end our night like watching a movie, but um, on some nights we'll play cards. We play a lot of gin rummy. And then like a lot of times we also have friends over for dinner parties. Like we like to do one or two at least dinner parties a week we, um, for the first time have a guest room. So people stay over cause you know, we don't want anybody driving home after. Um, so that's super fun. And we don't yet have any pets, but we are soon getting chickens. So that's going to be a whole set of responsibilities. And we are also going to get a dog or maybe two. So that's going to be a whole new thing. So the one thing that I haven't figured out how to really, really work into my day aside from walks is like hardcore working out. And that's sort of the next phase now that we're out in Sonoma of figuring out how to get that in. But I've made like huge strides on the sort of mental health and physical health side in general. But that's one piece where I like, I'm still trying to wedge that in and, mm. and not wedge it, like make it a ritualized priority. Yeah, definitely. And the, as my mind goes to the tomatoes because Growing up in Ontario, Canada, I know what you mean about being overextended on your tomatoes. And <laughs> every year growing up, there was always a period of time. It was like eggs and tomatoes for breakfast and for lunch, you're going to have like a, you know, a tomato and cheese sandwich. And then it's dinner is going to be fried green tomatoes or homemade spaghetti sauce, or it's going to be like tomatoes all day, every day, because it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> It's, 
you know, you can't eat too many BLTs. You can't eat too many uh, tomato and burrata salads or, oh. and then we also like froze so many of them. We peeled so many, we give so many away, you know, tomatoes. When you have your chickens, I used to keep chickens. They will help with offload some of that stuff from the garden, which will be really, oh, yes. um, it'll be yeah. incredibly helpful for you for sure. Well, totally. Jen, I want to, th- oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I did a quick check and we got two more checks while I was on the phone, a 25 K check and a 20 K check. So See? I think that puts us over 1.2. So we've got to get to 1.5 by the end of the day, which I'm certain we will. <laughs> well, yes, we will. And I'm going to introduce you to the Yankee stadium connection. Uh, amazing. Mr. Yankee stadium, which is bananas, but anyway, so see, and this is, for everyone listening, this is the power of putting it out there. Who do you want to meet? Where do you want to be connected to? Because it, it, those and all those desires, if they live inside you, they'll never live externally and you won't achieve your dreams. Right. And that's why it's so important to constantly be putting it out there, putting it out there, putting it out there. And so, Jenna, I want to thank you so much for being here on the show. I feel like I've met someone I've known my entire life and I want to celebrate you. I am so excited for you. And uh, let's get you into Yankee Stadium. Well, Heck yes. <laughs> All right. Let's do there it. We we're going to make, there we go. we're not going to yeah. make, and then we're, the and then show, we're going but... to see Beyonce. We're going to see Beyonce right after. You know, what we should do. Well, let's do this. Hold on. I'm grabbing my phone. We're so, oh, yeah. Let's mark the moment. Oh, no. Uh, something even better. Hold on. All right. Let's see if he's going to pick up. He's on the East Coast. Oh, my God. Just a minute. We'll see. You can tell him we're already at Chase Center. It is Friday night. His wife might be making him go to something on Broadway, which he loves. <laughs> I think he saw Hamilton like 50 times. Oh, man. Lucky guy. Like the original... He'll text me in five minutes. So anyway, everyone, I am calling Brandon Steiner for Jen, Mr. Yankee Stadium. And he's been on the show a couple of times. Um, He sold dirt from Yankee Stadium and he made millions of dollars. Then he went back and sold seats from Yankee Stadium, has hung out with Jeter. He um, had retail stores in Yankee Stadium. So that's who we're calling. He's going to call me back in five minutes, but we're not going to stay on the air for that. Anyway, all of you raw and real entrepreneurs everywhere around the world. Uh, if you have enjoyed this show, hopefully as much as I have, so fun, tag uh, Jen and I. So on social, it'll all be in the show notes, but on Instagram, it's Unfem Wines. Pronounce it correctly, friends. And um, that's a great way to tag her. I've already followed her on Instagram. Make sure you're following me on Instagram at Susan Sly and um, on the show. And please tag us, share. We would love a five-star review, whatever country you're in and order some wine. Go to unfemwines.com and order your wine. So, oh, and uh, Jen will send you a tomato. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Everyone gets a tomato for you and a tomato for you. All exactly. right. Anyway, Jen, thanks so much for being here. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And we really appreciate it. Uh, all right, everyone. God bless. Go rock your day. And I will see you in the next episode. Are you currently an employee looking to start your own business? Maybe you've been thinking about it for a while and you're just not sure where to start. Well, my course, Employee to Entrepreneur, combines my decades of experience as an entrepreneur with proven methods, techniques, and skills to help you take that leap and start your own business. This course is self-paced, learn on demand, and comes with an incredible workbook. And that will allow you to go through this content piece by piece by piece 
absorb it, take action, and then go on to the next module. So check out my course on susansly.com, Employee to Entrepreneur.